Moore College of Art and Design's Visionary Woman Award celebrates excellence in leadership and recognizes women who have a powerful impact on the visual arts. Funds raised from the awards event are placed into a Visionary Woman Award scholarship for more students. The 2005 Visionary Woman Award honorees are Wilhelmina Cole Holliday and Faith Ringgold. Their passion for excellence and their profound achievements for women's art set them apart as visionaries and as leaders. Welcome to the museum. Thank you. I'm Ariel and Virginia. Welcome. The women of Moore would like you to have this. Some leaders are born women. We think that's you. <laughs> Wilhelmina Cole was raised in upstate New York and attended Elmira College where she majored in art and later did graduate work at the University of Paris. Her grandmother, Gertrude Strong, helped develop Wilhelmina's appreciation of beauty and her eye for art. Wilhelmina married Wallace Holliday and they had two sons. In the 1960s, the Hollidays decided to develop an art collection. The focus for the collection was revealed to them on a trip to Europe. We were in Europe and we saw the work, beautiful work, of a woman named Clara Peters at the National Museum at Austria. We went on to the Prado in Spain and again saw her works, and yet neither one of us knew Clara Peters. I had studied history of art here and in Paris and worked at the National Gallery of Art, was on the board of a museum, and I had never heard of Clara Peters. And my husband is equally interested in art, has a master's in architecture and so forth. So we came home and we got out all of our source books and we made a discovery. There wasn't one woman in any of our books. The Holidays decided to challenge this inequity and address the lack of representation for women artists. They spent 20 years assembling the world's finest collection of women's art. As their strategy unfolded, more galleries purchased women's art, and the holiday's social and educational cause to promote women's art took hold. We're lucky. We've traveled all over the world. So wherever we went, we would go into the top commercial gallery, and we'd say, what do you have by a woman? They'd say, nothing. We'd say, well, that's what we're interested in. Six months later, knowing that we were a prospective purchaser, they would call us up and say, we found a beautiful painting by a woman from the Renaissance or from the 18th century French, 17th century Dutch. And this is how we put the collection together. In 1980, with the support of Nancy Hanks, former chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Wilhelmina Cole Holiday founded the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Initial tours of the collection were conducted in her home while she worked to create a dedicated site for the museum. We were able to gather people who were, had clout in the financial world, the social world, the museum world, etc. This country has a great, great tradition of volunteerism and philanthropy. This, this museum, I know, could not have been done the way it was done in any other country in the world. But it was Wilhelmina's vision and determination that ultimately led to the founding of a national museum with its own site dedicated to women's art. In 1983, the museum purchased the landmark Masonic Temple, an almost 80,000 square foot building on New York Avenue Northwest in Washington, D.C., and began a four-year renovation project. Its design led to numerous architectural awards, and in the spring of 1987, the National Museum of Women in the Arts opened the doors of its permanent location, with the Holidays works as the heart of the permanent collection. As a matter of fact, until the year this museum opened, 1987, there wasn't one woman in the leading text in our country when you study history of art. It's called Janssen's History of Art, you probably know it. So what does this mean? It means that anyone who went to school and studied history of art before 1987 simply doesn't know women artists. We are now one of the 10 largest museums in the world who measure by membership. 
members and thousands of other museum visitors can enjoy the growing permanent collection with more than 3,000 works from the 16th century to today's most contemporary forms. There are also special exhibitions and distinctive collections. The museum also reaches out internationally through partnerships with the Louvre, the Hermitage, and other great museums. An extensive library and research center, various publications, and programs for children complement the museum's mission to educate and promote women's art. Other forms of women's distinct creativity are expressed in the museum's state-of-the-art auditorium, featuring poetry, dance, costume design, and music. After almost 20 years, the legacy of Wilhelmina Cole Holiday is assured, thanks to her unwavering vision for a place to celebrate women's art through the ages and into the future. Whenever you can to help people as a whole, be sure you do it with your art. Thank you very much. Faith Ringgold's art and writing resonate with her rich cultural heritage and her unflinching desire to address social injustice. Faith was raised in Harlem and credits her tenacious spirit and artistic success to a happy childhood and parents who supported her art from the very beginning. Really, I always attribute my interest in being an artist to the fact that I had asthma as a child. And consequently, I was home a lot, in bed, and it gave me time to myself, out of school. I really started school in second grade. I was the class artist, right straight through school. I was going to City College. I was told that I could major in, in art and minor in education, and that way I could get a, a degree in art education which my family was so happy about because then that meant I could be a teacher. Prior to teaching, Faith married and had two daughters. But she always worked on her art, although finding a gallery to represent what she called her super realism was a challenge in the early 1960s. At the time, she was influenced by writers James Baldwin and Amiri Baraka. Faith joined the Spectrum Gallery in 1967. In the beginning, of course, in the 60s, with my political art forms, um, I mean, people just weren't interested. They didn't want the work, they didn't like the work, they didn't like the subject matter of the work, the American People series, and it, was, it, it had to do with the Civil Rights Movement, the flag is bleeding, uh, die, the uh, Black Power postage stamp, you know, really big, telling kinds of confrontations between black and white people. I was trying to comment on my time. I was trying to be one of the voices, one of the people who had something to say, you know? And uh, I was trying to tell my story. Faith's social activism continued in the 1970s. She was a feminist, an activist, and championed the rights of black artists for equal representation in major galleries, she returned to teaching, including several years at University of California at San Diego. What has always inspired me is people and the kinds of situations people find themselves in and how they deal with it. In the 70s, I was making three-dimensional objects. I was making sculptures and masks. I was doing performances. Faith's family, which includes her second husband, Burdette Ringgold, has supported her art. And her beloved mother, Willie Posey Jones, a highly regarded fashion designer in Harlem, helped Faith design and sew costumes, and later, her first quilt. Mrs. Jones also took Faith and her granddaughters on European vacations, including to the Louvre in Paris. This was immortalized in one of Faith's most famous series of quilts, Dancing at the Louvre. Prior to making quilts, Faith also made tankas, or cloth frame paintings. Because the tankas were good, but they, they were limited as to how big you could make them. Whereas a quilt, you could make a quilt the size of this room. This is a, an art form 
that was very important uh, as an art form during slavery, came over here from Africa. Of all the art forms Faith Ringgold has created, story quilts embody her mastery of narrative, stunning composition, and vibrant colors. Tar Beach, the first book Faith wrote for children and which originated from a story quilt she created several years earlier, won the Distinguished Caldecott Award for Children's Literature. Women communicate through, through the ages, through their families, with the quilts. And I said, I'm going to do this Woman on a Bridge series. And I'm going to show these fantastic women on bridges with these huge towers, you know, overlooking cities and, you know, overlooking time when I was a child. Growing up in Harlem, I used to go up on Tower Beach. My father would, would take up a mattress, and, and my mother and father and friends would be playing cards. And everybody would be on their rooftops. But the story I made up of this little girl who has all this wonderful power, because kids always think, even though they're little, they think that they have some influence over their family's future. I was not trying to write a children's story. I was simply writing a story that would recall my childhood. And I was telling my story, which is what I've been doing right through all of my experience as an artist. Faith Ringel went on to write and illustrate several more best-selling children's books, and a stunning compilation of her work was published in 2004. Her autobiography was published in 2005, and she paints every day. This prolific artist has won numerous awards and almost 20 honorary doctorates, including her very first one from Moore College of Art and Design. I feel extremely good about the fact that I have gotten these honorary doctorates from notably schools that are very much invested in art and in women. This is fantastic. And, more, and to have more College of Art be the first for art and women, you know, my two things. That was great. I loved it. Two women, two distinct visions, and the world of art and design is transformed forever. Through art, you can touch people and you can speak for them. And with your sensitivity and your perception, because artists see things a little more clearly than others. That's what gives them the God-given gift to create and to express. I often t used to tell my students, you know, there is no art police it's in your studio telling you what you can't do. If you stay in the game, you know, you're going to wear everybody out. They're going to just say, oh, damn it, let her through. 